Welcome back to the podcast, our faithful listeners. Um, So I'm going to make this episode extremely short. Having nothing but technical difficulties. So I have like background music playing in my head with the, the intro and sound effects and all these things. And nothing seems to be coming out. On audio, so if you guys hear any hear any of this, then obviously you can feel free to ignore my comments. But I'm extremely confused with the process on how this works. Um, this year, I'm aiming to do better. Aiming to do better, you know. Have an AV guy, but things always seem to mess up when he's not available. So I just have to be patient and trust God, because Lord knows I'm losing my patience. Um, but yeah, I'm going to make today's episode very quick and spicy, um, maybe about a good 20 minutes of your time. I want to I wanna ask you guys about something that you may have noticed, seen. Um, you can see by the title of today's video what I'm going to talk about. But if you have not already, be sure to go to GodlyDating101Book.com. Too many of you are listening to these videos that, number one, aren't subscribing. If you are listening, please subscribe. And two, you have not purchased the book yet. I'm wondering, what are you waiting on? Are you waiting until your friend buys it? Are you waiting until there's a giveaway? Because there will not be one. Because I know you spent money on coffee today. Anywho, um, so today's video, (laughs) I want to talk a little bit about the femininity of men. Um, But no, today's title will be Biblical Masculinity. Um, But I'm not going to dive too deep um, in this because I want to do a couple series. The goal of the podcast this year is to empower men, you know, get get us men to where we need to be spiritually. Because a lot of times, you know, a lot of men comment back, you know, about their what they're learning from the podcast. But a lot of women um, are growing because of the podcast. But the men aren't growing. So we have a lot of prepared women for marriage and underprepared men. So the women are getting ready for a man that doesn't exist. You know, and it's like, it doesn't make any sense if we tell the women what to do in order to get ready for marriage, and then we have men that aren't getting ready themselves. Um, So I want to dive a little bit into this because I saw a post that was highly disturbing. Um, It was from a pastor. You know, I wanted to get him on the podcast. He didn't respond. Um, Seems like a cool dude. Maybe he'll come on in the future. Um, But I want you to understand this episode is important no matter your gender. Because if you're a guy, you need to know what you're striving for. You need to understand things that we need to avoid, things that we need to you know, things that God expects. Um, And also, if you're a woman, you need to know the type of guys you're entertaining. Because a lot of women think they're entertaining men of God, but they're entertaining guys that go to church. Two different things. They think they're entertaining men who love Jesus, but in reality, you know, we just follow him in name only. Um, And I know that's true, because I know what it means to follow God by just attending church services, but not necessarily having that actual relationship. But this pastor shared a post, and I thought, I, I think I get your point, but I think this was poorly written. Um, so Dale Partridge, uh, I can't remember the name of the ministry that he runs. I think it's called Redefine Christianity or something along those lines. Um, he says, almost everywhere I go, I see guys that act gay who aren't gay. Their posture, their mannerisms, their clothing, and their speech are all overly effeminate. Ultimately, society isn't just producing more gay people. It's also nurturing gay culture among men. Pretty loaded. Um, I think I think I get his point. If you, if you heard that clearly, I think you understood what he was aiming for. However, I think a lot of us, you know, we become the police on what's right or what's wrong. You know, I have an idea of how a man should look. And if you're not doing that, now you're feminine feminine, or you're immature, you're, you're not a real man because I defined it. And I'm not saying he was saying that from a judgmental place because he says these men are men who don't, who aren't interested in the same sex, but they're acting like men who live that lifestyle do. So I think he made a great point because I believe it's a, I think it's a fact that society aims to feminize our men, um, you know. We have men, women winning um, Miss America and men, men in women's sports. And men, you know what I mean? It's just like if you're seen as a tough guy, you're now you're a problem. But when you're, you know, they, they want you to be in touch with your feelings, which is necessary, but they want you overly obsessed with emotions and feelings and all those things. 
And I believe society is really causing our men to be below the standard of where God calls them. You have men that that act this way. You know, they claim they're acting in the movies when they're doing these scenes. Um, what makes me really uncomfortable, especially when people always send me memes of like church people, um, you know, they're making fun of things they see in church. I won't say any of the names because you've probably seen some of these social media influencers who, who they make good comedy, but they dress up as women in order to make people laugh. And while Tyler Perry makes millions of dollars doing it, it makes me uncomfortable because the Bible made it clear, you know, that if a man is dressing like a woman or a woman is dressing like a man, I believe that's Deuteronomy 22 and 5. Um, God made that clear that that was an abomination to him. So a lot of times what we find entertaining, God finds highly disturbing. And it's a problem when I'm laughing at things that God isn't pleased with. The Bible says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination to the Lord thy God. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's Old Testament. No, the Old Testament doesn't, the, Jesus dying on, on, on Calvary does not erase what the Old Testament says. The goal of Calvary was to remove like the ceremonial law. We don't have to do all these sacrifices and be rules and all these things because God is our sacrifice. But when you see that principle, God was establishing something um, that my leader, David Bernard, he likes to call gender distinction. We have to understand that God really has a passion to separate the man from the woman. The Bible made it clear when God created them, you know, it, it's not, he didn't create them the same. None of us are the same. And, you know, when we blur the lines, eventually, you know, it goes from just a unisex shirt to a man wanting to dress like a woman, a man wants to act like a woman. And it's highly disturbing. And that's why I love, you know, when men dress a certain way, women dress a certain way, and not because you're holy, because a man is in pants and a woman is in a skirt. But I just love when people aim to desire to be modest and aim to do something that is not causing them to be like the opposite sex. Um, you know, because I have, a, I have a, one of my homies, you know, I'm in school. A lot of you, you know, pray for me. Nursing school has been absolutely overwhelming. I'm up recording this episode I'm going to be past midnight by the time I get everything ready um, to post it. Um, and he like gets his nails done. And I don't mean like a regular, you know, guy's just got a manicure, clean your nails up. I mean like, no, like designs and all those things on his nails. Not attracted to males, but that's his style. In my opinion, that could be viewed as, you know, something this preacher could have been talking about. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of people, they view certain things as just style. But I don't really think God is viewing those things as style. And obviously, I don't, I don't, whatever you do is what you do. He's not a, a Christian person. But when it's happening to people inside the church, that's when I see the need that, okay, Dale, I agree with what you said. We really have to address this because this is a real problem in the church today. Um, you know, so I want to read a couple of verses for you before we dive a little bit into this episode. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Um, and I'm hoping you guys are listening and you're able to hear this because nothing is working right on my end. So I'm just going to upload this freestyle, not going to be able to do any editing because it's late and I still have to study for a test when I'm done. Um, but it says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes and hear this or practice homosexuality. Or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. And I think this is the part where some Christians don't read. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So the way the King James Version puts that, which I prefer, but I read this so anybody who's younger, especially you can understand. Um, instead of it saying practicing homosexuality, it says, the Bible says the effeminate are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So we have to understand that God is very clear in his word that he does not want feminine men. He does not want our men to be feminine or our women to be masculine. He created you a certain way to be that way. And it's a problem when we go against God's design, trying to be things that we're not. You know, so effeminate is really just meaning you're behaving in a way that's, I'm behaving in a way, if it's me, that's acceptable if I was a woman, but not acceptable because I'm a male. Um, and it's funny because I just shared a meme um, with my friend and it was saying, if you're not careful, literally just today, if you're not careful, those um, those girls, the girl sayings will sneak up on you. I don't remember what it was exactly. 
And the guy commented back was like, not me agreeing with you. <laughs> I'm over here laughing in the room by myself. I'm worried though. But it's hilarious because, um, and, and obviously you probably don't get the joke if you're not black, but you know, that's, I get, I think that's like a black saying is, you know, where women are saying these things or, you know, not me agree, you know, whatever story for another day. Cause I, I feel silly, but <laughs> we have to understand that God takes this stuff very seriously. And he's saying those who are practicing an effeminate lifestyle are not inheriting the kingdom of God. Why? Because whether you were living that lifestyle prior to Christ, now that you are in Christ, he's trying to change your lifestyle. So if you're still practicing that same lifestyle, that means you're not really in Christ, you know, and we have to check ourselves. Are there ways in me that I'm not exhibiting the way that God desires? And truth be told, there are plenty of ways within each and every one of us that isn't pleasing in God's sight. And we have to be willing to address, our, uh, the allow God to address the things that are within us. So the theme of today's podcast is really just for us to, you know, see a little bit more of what God wants us to strive for. And I wish he would have been able on this, been on this podcast because I would hate for you to, me to take his words out of context and it seems like I'm attacking him. No, no, no disrespect. I literally have one of his books and loved it. Um, but I want you guys to understand that we, we have a different standard in the church. And I know that in today's generation, I won't say who the pastor was because um, you probably love him, but someone sent me um, a video of a, a preacher preaching. And it wasn't that he was in pink that was disturbing. I literally own a pink suit. I wore it, rocked it with my wife. We went to a friend of ours wedding. I thought I was the coolest Pepto-Bismol you've ever seen in life. You know what I'm saying? So I thought I was fresh. We get to the get to the wedding. We're going there. We're enjoying ourselves, dancing, whatever, blah, 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 blah. No one thought anything of it. They thought it was nice. But then somebody sent me recently, a couple months back, um, a, a video of a pastor preaching, and it was highly disturbing. Um, the you know the outfit just seemed a little too flashy. You know the hot pink thing was going on. The hair was dyed. It literally looked like he was preaching about a like a look at me type of thing, like a celebrity type thing. You know something you see at a concert. So I'm you know, and a lot of people like to say, "What well, tomorrow?" We we're not going to focus on what a guy was wearing. What, but what was he saying? Was it coming from the heart of God? And from what I've heard in that message, it wasn't a solid message either. It was you know scripture taken out of context in order to push an agenda. Not necessarily that the agenda was wrong. You know, if you're, as long as you're leading people to Christ, that's always a win. But the it, the doctrine didn't seem sound. So it was highly disturbing. It looked like a circus, and uh, it was about three people actually that sent it to me, and they asked me my opinion. And I only responded to one of them because I didn't want to upset the others. And it, it, I just let them know my, my frustration with that type of preaching because you cannot be a man and you, if, if someone just saw you from afar, they're automatically assuming you live an alternative lifestyle. You have to understand that God desires for you to be different. And there are a lot of men who, who aren't macho men. I'm not a macho man. You know, I, I'm not saying you have to be a handyman in order to be called by God, but there's a problem when you look just like the world, or you look like you could pass for a woman. That's a huge issue. So there's a few things that society likes to define a man as. And some of these, I think I've probably even fallen prey to. So number one, I'll say money. I think a lot of men fall prey to the idea that our money is what defines us, or defines our masculinity. Um, there's some people... Um, I don't even know about this guy, so I probably shouldn't bring him up. But there's a whole bunch of people who go crazy over, um, I think his name is Andrew Tate. I don't know if it's because of his politics, because I know like conservative people post him. But then there are people that are like um, on the other side of the spectrum who love him because of how he talks about women. So I don't know. He's just polarizing figure. Um, you know, I think he got arrested recently. Um, goes to show you how much you need to stop looking at people in the world. But I guess he's he has so much money. He talks about Bugattis and all these type of expensive vehicles that he has. And it's no shade to him. Hey, congrats, bro. Give me a Bugatti. You know what I mean? That costs more than my house. You know, all that is good to go. But why did we place him on such a pedestal because of his money? He has shown nothing in his character that defines him as a good or a biblical leader. But there are a lot of Christian people that, that, that listen to him. And that's why I, I had felt the need to bring that up. But there was a lot of times that people feel as though a man is worthless because he doesn't make six figures or something like that. A woman is saying, I'm not going to date a guy unless he makes six figures. There are some women who literally um, think like that. And if you're one of those, hey, shout out to you, sis, but you might be single for a while. It says one study said men, only 13% of men earn 100000 per year and above. 
and then only 6% of women earn that much. And then another study said only 5% of men earn at a minimum six figures per year. So it the it's slim pickings out here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Slim pickings. Like you're not gonna be able to just find anybody. But unfortunately, a lot of people feel as though a man cannot provide for a family unless he makes an overwhelming amount of money when God calls us to provide in a lot more ways than just financial. And you don't need a hundred thousand or two million in order to be a good good husband, a good leader. A lot of people think it's a status. Some people think because of somebody's position that they have worth. Um, and you may not see it, but let's just take, for example, a lot of you are going to show your teacher more respect than you're showing a custodian. A lot of you show way more respect to your boss than you show to the person that you're leading. Why? Because you're respecting status. You're not respecting the person. And we we play such a, a, an idea that if I attain such status, then I have worth. If I become the pastor, then I have worth. We play so much. We do this in the church. We place so much emphasis on a person with a platform. We place so much emphasis. We're, we're so quick to listen to our pastor. And some of y'all pastors don't even be biblical. You know what I mean? And I'm not even saying that to shade, but some of these pastors aren't even biblical. And then you're quick to listen to them, but to let a, a random brother or sister offend you or take your seat and you're willing to hold a grudge. That shows the immaturity and you're not. And if you're a man, that shows that you're not operating in a masculine way. That shows immaturity in you. You're operating like a child. And I know women do it as well, but I'm just talking about today's episode. When we talk about femininity, I'm hoping to, and I always struggle with that word, and I already know who's about to message me right now laughing at me, and whatever, because I will block you. Um, but I'm hoping to get Safi in on that episode, or possibly get a guest in, because there's a lot I can say, but I, I would love to hear um, the woman's perspective as well, especially when it comes to that. I mean, and then another thing a lot of people take um, um, misunderstand about masculinity is that we believe that it's the amount of women that like you that defines who you are as a man. And growing up in my neighborhood, I tell you guys all the time on a podcast, I even mentioned it in the book, um, Godly Dating 101 book. Uh, if you haven't gotten that and you're listening, I want you to know that God, God is watching. God is watching. Um, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. So a lot of you, you aim to get to your best self. Me personally, I feel like I'm at my best self when I've been constant in my word of, in the word of God and seeking God and church and exercise and having great time with my family. All those things is when I feel at my best. But to be honest, it's kind of hard to get there unless you are in the right space, both mentally and emotionally. A lot of times we Christians, we only focus on our spiritual, but we also have to focus on our emotional health. And I believe that having therapy in your life can help you with good coping skills, good boundaries, allow you to uncover the things that you're really dealing with and help you learn the necessary tools in order to resolve them. So if you're a person that's thinking about giving therapy a try, I would encourage you to try BetterHelp. They're a great option because they're both, it's convenient, flexible, affordable, and it's entirely online. Um, and just fill out a brief questionnaire. And after you finish with that questionnaire, they'll pair you, pair you with a, a therapist, a licensed therapist that you're able to switch at any point in time. So that won't be an issue. So if you would like to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash godly to get today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash godly. Um, but I want you to understand that a lot of us, we get that impression that, oh, the women are chasing him. You know, that's that's a real man. No, that's, you're not defined by the amount of women that are interested in you. Because that, that that little player mentality, it doesn't set you up for success in the long run. But I want to uh, mention a few traits. I'm trying to make this episode under 30 minutes. So I'm going to run through a few traits that everybody must have. And I know a lot of you, you may feel as though I already have this or my boyfriend already has that, my husband already has that. But a lot of you, you are dating people that don't have any of these traits. Any. They go to church, but they have zero of these traits. And I want you to listen to a couple of these and see how you can implement it, fellas. Um, I'm trying to see how I can implement them. And ladies, please be sure that you don't commit to somebody unless you see them trying to start for these principles. Number one, a biblical masculinity is, number one, is a man who can lead his home. Y'all be thinking, y'all gonna get a man to lead y'all to Christ, and this brother can't lead himself to, to Christ. Like, the logic in that, to me, is baffling. Like, it really doesn't make any sense to me how you can assume this man don't even like going to church. This Read a Bible. 
What do you, what do you mean read the Bible? I read my verse of the day. I'm not going to read a chapter. You're, you're dating a guy who does not care to invest in his ball with God, but you expect to have a blessed future. No, you can get married. That doesn't mean God is in that union. I want you to hear this verse in Genesis 18, 19. It says, for I know him, this is God speaking, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring up upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So before God decided, I'm going to call Abraham to do my will, I'm going to bless Abraham to do my will. God made it clear that it was something he knew about Abraham. So I'm promising you, you're going to be a father of many nations. Us till this day, we as children of God, Christians today, are called children of Abraham by faith. Like we're in Abraham's seed. We're a part of that lineage and those blessings that God promised Abraham by faith. So God knew it was something about Abraham that he would be able to be the one that God could use, that first patriarch. And what did God say? God said, I knew that he would be able to command his children and his household after him, and they would keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. The number one thing regarding biblical masculinity, you have to be able to be a biblical leader. And that's something where I have to strive for, because how do I, like, it's so frustrating having kids and knowing that they have to answer to God. It's one thing to know that, man, I'm a terrible human being. God going to have to have some mercy when he see me because you know how many times I don't repent it? I went back to the same foolishness every day of my life. you know. But to know that I have children that's going to have to answer to God is a terrifying thought. If I do it wrong, if I stare at them the wrong way, how do they answer before God if I wasn't a good leader? But God looked at Abraham and said, I know I could trust him to be the father of many nations because I know what he's going to teach his, teach his kids so you have to watch what you're teaching people. Are you that type of man that is able to teach people how to follow God? Are you dating a guy or courting a guy, engaged to a guy? That's a question I'm going to I'm going to I'm, I'm going to have to throw at some of the young people at our church cuz I know a lot of young people are dating and they're not ready for marriage. Their their hormones are raging. They want sex so bad, but they don't have a clue how to be in a relationship that honors God. And I want us to see can God look at you and say, I know this is the type of Christian that's going to be able to teach his kids what it means to be saved, what it means to live for God, what it means to be pure. Because there's a lot of people that get married and the moment they get married, they forget about God. But let me jump into the next one. You have to, biblical masculinity. A real masculine man is a man that is respectful. I'm seeing so many men that are just flat out disrespectful to their woman, whether in public or in private. Just because you abuse her in, in private doesn't mean that it's not going to come out because God sees it. Everything in dark comes to light. You know, and just because, you know, you make her feel one way. It's like, no, nah, we have to re we have to respect our wives. And the reason why I say that, um, the Bible says it like this in, in NLT, 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she's your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Listen, God said, if you don't respect that woman, your prayers are not being heard. I know a lot of people don't understand that concept because of how we still are disrespectful to our spouses, how we still are rude and all those things. But God said, if you don't respect her, I'm not listening to you. Tavares, you just told your wife she needs to shut up and you in here speaking in tongues? Tavares, you in here, you just yelled at your wife and you just belittled her and you just mistreated her and you in my presence preaching. You're you're really coming to me asking me to bless you with a, a promotion on your job and you're mistreating your, your family. The logic, like, I feel as though biblical masculinity requires a man who has that type of character, whereas he is going to be respectful because a lot of men feel as though I'm the head of the home. So you answer to me. When the Bible says there should be equal submission, don't treat her like she's less than you. Maybe she may be the weaker vessel, but it says she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. So we have to understand that. So before I go to God's presence, asking God for new things, I need to go apologize to my wife. I need to also go repent of all my foolishness. Do not feel as though you can just come into God's presence doing whatever you want. There's a lot of people who feel as though we can do whatever we want. We can mistreat people however we want. 
we can go thought it up, we can go smash half the city, and then God is just supposed to accept us. No, man, that's not how God, that's not how God works. I don't care who's your popular pastor, I don't care what trendy church you're at. Listen, God has a standard, only one standard in the entire Bible. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. That is God's, God's standard for us. Um, that doesn't mean you won't make a mistake, but be holy means what? To be set apart, be consecrated. So that's what we need to strive for. To be honest, it's a struggle for me, you know what I mean? Being consecrated in my thoughts, in my actions, in my motives. So I'm not trying to make this seem like I'm preaching at you. I'm saying this to myself. I'm literally looking at a camera talking to myself. You know, I want us to understand that God desires us to be respectful and honor people. So if you're in a relationship, and you know, especially for you listening that are married, we need to treat her as though she's special, not like she's common. Nah, that's not how you do it. You don't just get her and then treat her like she's common. We have to keep our eyes on that woman, on my wife, not on all the girls, no matter how thick, curvy, whatever is your type, no matter how they look, we have to keep our eyes on one woman. Proverbs says, may her breast satisfy you always, speaking of a man to his wife. So it's not someone else's breast. It's like, let's be clear, you know, so we have to be, we have to be real vigilant in how we allow our emotions to get wrapped up, you know, because in the, Cheating is one thing, but also emotional cheating is also another thing. So you really have to guard yourself, you know, and we have to gas her up every every chance you get because it's not enough for me to not, it's not acceptable for me to gas up women on the road. Hey, girl, you look nice. Hey, nice outfit. And then my wife and I ignore her. Listen, man, fellas, real masculinity is not a man who's out here complimenting all the women in the world. Can you love that one woman a million different ways? That's the key. Fourth thing, a man of integrity. And you know, I had to bring Joseph in this because it's very easy for us when we get that moment of temptation to give in. Or maybe just me. I hope not just me, but the struggle gets real. But Joseph was a man, the Bible says, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Genesis 39 and 9. He didn't look at it as though I'm disrespecting Potiphar. He looked at it as though, man, I can't even... I can't even do that, bro. God is going to be disappointed. I can't entertain this relationship. And that's what we have to think. We have to stop viewing it as though it's rules and start viewing it as though I want to honor my relationship with God because it's a relationship, you know? So not just, we have, it, it's just, we when you view it as though, oh, well, this is my spouse and I don't want to not, I'm not trying to not cheat on my spouse because I don't want her mad. No, I want to do it because I love her. And that's the same thing with our relationship with God. We want to make sure we're doing things out of our love for him and not just, I don't want to go to hell because, you know, fear only work gets you so far. You know, so you want to do things out of love. Um, the next thing a man has to be, fourth thing is a person who stands for righteousness. And I said, and I say this because it says um, in second Peter two, five, and spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So when God was ready to destroy the world, there was one man who found grace in God's eyes. You know, the Bible mentioned he found favor. In Genesis 8, 1, God saw nothing but wickedness, but there was one guy. It doesn't even talk about his family. But that man was a real man because he stood for what God said, no matter what the rest of society was doing. So all you little boys that you're chasing every chant, every trend, you're what you want to put on everything the cool rappers got on. You want to do everything all your boys doing. You're not operating the way God wants you to be. You can't be because you're not following his will. True masculinity. A real man, biblically speaking, is a man who is going to stand for righteousness no matter what everyone else is doing. And I'm sure the Bible made it clear that Noah was building this art for quite some time. Some people believe it could have been over a hundred years. Noah's spending all his time building an ark while no one is joining in. So you have to understand, a real man is not waiting on affirmation from others to do what God called him to do. And the moment you start waiting on affirmation from others is the moment you're going to miss your purpose. It's the moment you're going to miss out what God wants to do. And God wants to bless your family, but he's not going to bless your family until you take a stand. So his entire family was saved because of that. And you know, that shows that God is waiting on that one man to get their attention to do great things through them. Another thing I want to say, and it's the last one I'll say, real masculinity is a man who's not afraid to be vulnerable. And I'll save this one for last because I think I'm going to make this a, an entire episode. I think I think you guys will love that. I'll probably get a guest on that. But it's, it's necessary for men to be vulnerable. Yeah, I'm going to make an episode on this. 
men, we must be vulnerable. But this year, every single one of you, I know it's going to be thousands of people that listen to the podcast. Please stop being selfish. Share this with a friend. Five stars, like, comment, engage with us in the YouTube comments. Share this with a friend. You're going to save someone's life by doing that. But in Acts 13, 13, it says, Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John is also surnamed Mark. So John Mark, it says they're about to go do some ministry, and Mark left. The Bible made it very clear. Paul was very frustrated with how his brother abandoned him. There was division, and, Paul, and you know, Mark had a different idea, so he left. Paul was very upset with that. However, Paul admitted that he needed Mark. So watch this. 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 11 in NLT. It says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens, Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Guys, I don't know how I don't know how you feel about this, but it is very I don't know if you agree. You're gonna have to let me know in the comments. But it is very difficult for a man to say they need help. I'm a man, listen. Once you show me who you are, you leave me when I needed you, bro. We ain't got nothing to talk about. I can promise you that. We ain't got nothing to discuss. I don't, I'm not gonna ask you for help. I'm not going to, hey, bro, do you mind? Hey, can I have some money? Hey, can you help me with this? I'm I'm not reaching out. Once I feel as though you've abandoned me when I needed you, it's hard for me to say, bro, I need your help. But that's the thing about vulnerability. Until you're willing to be vulnerable, it's hard for you to get a victory. You know, and wow, I just thought about it in, our, in one of our previous episodes with Lateris Whitfield. You're really going to want to listen to that. He was speaking about how God and the devil uses vulnerability. So it's great to use it the way God desires because the devil will use it to his advantage. So I want you to understand is so many of you men out there, you're hurting. Your marriage is trash right now. Your relationship is in shambles, but you're too afraid to tell somebody, hey, can I have some advice? You're hungry. Can't pay the bills. All you need is just, can somebody, you know, just spot me for lunch? But we don't let our pride get to us. Men, you know what's killing us today? Our pride, our e go absolutely killing us society doesn't tell men we're allowed to be vulnerable they want us to pretend to be tough you know and that's why men suicide rates are high um very popular guy just passed away known for his bubbly smile and dancing and acting and all those things and made a video with his family within two days says he um you know took his life why would a guy do that who knew he was hurting and that's the problem that's going on. So many of us were going through so much and we're not willing to be vulnerable. But Paul showed us true masculinity. When he needed help, he was willing to request for the person that abandoned him that he was just upset with. How many of you, somebody upset you at your church and you haven't spoken to them in weeks? Some of you even years. Someone in your family, they mistreated you and you haven't spoken to them in years. And even if you, you don't want to speak to that person, because they abused you or they, you know, they did some things that we don't want to speak of, but you still even haven't forgiven them. That's alarming because you you think you're a real man because you're tough. You think you're a real man because you're hiding your emotions, but in reality, you're hurting, you're wounded, you're broken. Why do you think prison is full of so many broken men? They were tough. They ran the streets. They had the guns. Man, I, you know, many of my friends... I just spoke to one of my boys, man. I'm, uh, you know, getting teary eyed thinking about it. I talked to one of my boys a couple of weeks ago. He posted something on social media saying, "Rest in peace to a guy that died when I think we were in the ninth grade, or maybe we were in middle school. The coolest kid died because of gang violence. I can't tell you the amount of friends I had get killed before sixteen. And I remember this phrase like Eric Pratt, bro. Remember, like I could see his face right now in my face right now. What's going on, Tavares? Coolest dude in the school." Didn't even make it to 16. Rest in peace, you know. Another homie named Willio. Man, it's a, I could go down a rabbit hole with a amount of guys that I died. But so many of us, we were wounded seeing these things. And we never talk about it. Why? Because we're not allowed to be vulnerable. 
you're soft, you're weak. Why is it that we think doing things the way God would want us, that we're weak? And it's because we allow society to define what true masculinity is. We allow society to lie to us. Prison is full of guys who never learned how to control their emotions. So they lashed out one moment of anger, 30 seconds, shot someone, stabbed someone, in prison the rest of their life because of a moment. One of my homies, he lashed out, almost killed a family member, 20 to life. We were only 16 when that happened. It's crazy because we're never taught. It's okay to be vulnerable. Let me know how you're feeling. When, why do, why do when, when, when we guys connect, we're talking about sports. We never just say, bro, tell me, how's your heart, bro? How you feeling? How's your marriage? How's the kids? We don't talk like that. Women do it. Women talk about everything. Child, it's stressful. But at the same time, it's like we men, we need to learn to open up. Because Paul thought this guy was an enemy. And then God showed it to him that this guy's needed for where I'm going to go next. And until you are willing to be vulnerable, you're never going to see what God really has for you. But I want that to be another episode, so I'm not going to go in too much. Man, that's overwhelming. Just thinking about that is a lot. What are some traits, in your opinion? I want you to comment below if you're listening on YouTube. What are some traits that men are missing? Please comment that. What are some things that we need to strive for? What are, if you're a guy, what are some things that you believe that you might be lacking? Some of these biblical masculinity traits. What are some things? And obviously, I didn't make a long, exhaustive list. I want to keep our episodes short. I don't want to do the absolute most. I want to make sure you guys get the information in our book, Godly Dating 101. Go on Amazon. The link is in the description box. You keep telling yourself you're going to do it. Don't do it next week. Do it now, like the Everest guy. <laughs> no, but I love you guys, man. I, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you for your patience. I hope the audio works because it's been a hot mess, but we'll be seeing you next week. Hopefully, the AV guy's back. Peace.